All right, we're going to begin. Tonight's topic is part of the series of the challenges, the struggles, the trials of the 21st century. This is a very unique time to be living in. Unique because so many things are happening. Life is very, very different than it was in the past, but not necessarily in a good way. There are many, many difficulties, many challenges, as we will be seeing. Tonight's topic is one of those painful areas that many of us are witnessing, perhaps experiencing, and that is materialism. So I called the topic materialism the cause of all ills. As you will see, the problem with materialism today is much greater than it was in the past, and because of that it has taken a toll on just about every area of life, marriages, personal happiness, and so forth. Perhaps we should first define what materialism is. A good definition, as I found, is that materialism is when certain possessions, material possessions, and physical comfort are more important than spiritual values. That is perhaps a brief definition of what it represents. But what's interesting is that in philosophy, there is also such a doctrine that says that materialism is a doctrine that nothing exists except matter and its movement and modifications, which I find very interesting because that's all that's emphasized. That's all that is believed to exist is matter. Well, what about spirituality? So these two, the simple definition of materialism and this doctrine in philosophy are pretty much the same. They are related. It means that there is no spirituality whatsoever. No belief that something else, something other than materialism exists. What is the problem with this? What's wrong with living a materialistic life? After all, the human body is physical. Perhaps the rabbis give us the answer to that when they tell us in ethics of our fathers, in Pirkei Avot, what tends to ruin people's life, what tends to remove them from this world and from the world to come, the source of pretty much all trouble, is envy, desire, and the pursuit of honor. Many people have trouble in these areas. Many people have a weakness in these areas. And if these weaknesses are not dealt with properly and on time, there's a chance that they will have a very detrimental effect on people's lives. Life could turn out to be something completely different, more beautiful, happier, with much more satisfaction if we were to eliminate these three or at the very least to control them. So the rabbis are telling us pretty much at the start what will make you happy and what will make you unhappy. What will make you unhappy is kinata vave kabod. It will lead to all sorts of problems that some of them we don't even, we cannot even anticipate as a result of these three characteristics <coughs> or weaknesses that, for the most part, all of humanity has always had. It's nothing new. What I want to do the next few minutes, however, is to focus on what professionals, researchers, have said, especially nowadays. Not necessarily Jewish. Just individuals who took it upon themselves as a, perhaps a project, to investigate why people are so unhappy, what has happened, how come things are so different today than they were in the past. So I want to share with you just a, cu a couple of comments, briefly, of what these studies show. For example, one study about people who have become more materialistic in this generation shows that their well-being, the, their well-being meaning their sense of purpose, their autonomy, their 
relationships, this well-being, what could be the potential well-being, diminishes when they become more materialistic. As they become less materialistic, it rises. The well-being of people, whether it's relationships, sense of purpose, all of these are meaningful areas in our life. All of these are easily affected with having the wrong values by emphasizing the wrong things. I would also add to this that aside from materialism, today there's another concept that many of you perhaps are familiar with, and that's called consumerism. People are buying a lot of stuff these days. And this has become really a way of life or a value system. A value system which preoccupies itself with possessions and the social image that they project. I'm quoting briefly here from the various studies that have been done in these areas. What I found, however, very disturbing, and so did the, the researchers, are the many photos shown that appear in magazines. There's all kinds of magazines, tons of magazines out there, newspapers, but many magazines that are geared towards fashion and are very materialistic in their outlook. And what kind of photos are you going to see? One photo that this individual who, who did this study saw was a young man wearing four Rolex watches. Not one, four. What for? Another one, young man posing in front of his own private helicopter. And many photos of women lost in the design, in the latest design clothing of, their, of the times. This was the emphasis. This is what they valued. This is what they cared for. This is where they spent their money and their time on all this materialism. What's interesting is that the goal of the photos were to show plenty, or to show perhaps affluence and wealth. That was the goal. But instead, if you really look a little bit deeper into this, you will notice that it's not really showing plenty, it is showing a void. It is showing emptiness in these people's life. They're trying to fill that void, that emptiness, with whether it's designer clothes or gadgets, with the thought that this perhaps will make them happy. I always wonder, I'm really puzzled. I think they call it in this country Black Friday when everybody all of a sudden rushes to buy all of these latest gadgets at a discount. I've seen pictures of people sleeping there the night before to make sure they come in right away, that they don't lose out. And think about it. Let's say they do get it for a discount. How long will that happiness last? They're going to look at their new gadget, they're going to play with it, whatever it may be, whatever it is. How long will that happiness last? Don't they know by now that money doesn't bring happiness, nor any materialism? But people live with this kind of a, of a dream, that this is what's worth pursuing, this is what life is all about. And if you don't have it, you're miserable. <laughs> it's just the opposite. The more people pursue these things, the more emphasis on materialism, that is what is going to make them unhappy. Because there's something missing there. And it's not material wealth. And it's not comforts either, physical comforts. There's something else. They don't realize it yet. But they're trying. But they're looking up the wrong alley. Another stu study that begins with the 1990s especially, found something very interesting about the main reason people attend college. What would you think? If you were to ask a lot of people, what's 
your reason for attending college. So this study found, this is as of the 1990s, that the most frequent reason for attending colleges, for going to universities, is to make a lot of money. And this is so different than the response that I guess researchers used to get years ago, where it was either to become an authority in a field, some, some field, or to help others in difficulty. These last two ex are examples, true examples, of what people gave as an explanation for higher education, for going to college. After all, college is expensive, right? Certain colleges are very expensive. And today, the reason you hear it, the most frequent reason, is to make a lot of money. That's what's on people's mind. Many studies were done, not just one or two, many studies were done that bring out pretty much the same, what I just said. I prefer to call this syndrome or this materialism problem with the words or with the term the credit card society. Why do I call it the credit card society? Because I have noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed possibly too, that today people spend money that they don't have for things that they probably don't need. And this is all as a result of the use of credit cards. Now, I'm not just blaming credit cards. Credit cards can be good too. But this is one way of looking at what has happened, is people allow themselves today, it's a fact, certain things that in the past they would not have allowed themselves. People worked a lot harder in the past to get the basics. And today they see the ease at which they can get certain things and they become spoiled. There was, there's quite a few factors in the, the, in the generation that we're living today, including policy, government policy, and of course, birsomot, as we call it in Hebrew, all the billboards, all the advertisement, that, of course, causes a tremendous amount of confusion. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it teaches or guides people in a very powerful way. It influences them what they should buy. Well, why should I buy it? Because I'm telling you it's good for you. This is made in America. You know what that does to people who don't live in this country, either, whether in the Middle East or some other countries? It's made in America. This is Belgian chocolate. You know, it's not just any chocolate. You have to try it. It's the best. Look at how, how advertisement works. And many people, I think even the majority, they fall for it. They may not need it. It may not even be the best item, perhaps there is better out there, but because competition is strong and because of advertisement, people are lured into buying all these things. You know how many machines, computers and the like are sitting in people's garage collecting dust that they never ended up using. They bought it. It's on sale. Is it really on sale? I don't know, but they say so. But even so, you already have one. No, but this is better, it's faster, you have to change it. And many companies will no longer support the older product because they want you to buy the new one. Well, there's many, many examples, and I can go on forever, in giving you examples of how society has become so materialistic. And companies, of course, understand this. The big companies realized that there, is, there are consumers out there who are willing to pay. And there's a lot of wealthy consumers who are willing to pay even more. So why not charge them 500% <laughs> for something that is really not worth that much? Well, it has a brand name, so what? Is it really worth it? People don't pay attention to these things anymore. If they have the money, they will go for it. If they don't have the money, they will borrow it on credit or otherwise. What's the result of all of this? The immediate result of this is that this behavior, this kind of behavior, smashes 
the happiness and peace of mind of those who succumb to it. This is the result, this is the conclusion of those researchers. They have noticed it. It smashes, it takes away their happiness and peace of mind. They're so preoccupied with acquiring more possessions, physical possessions. I like Francis Bacon quote about money. He says it like this, money is a great servant, but a bad master. Did you understand that? It is a great servant because it could help us in many ways. Money can be very helpful as a means, but not as a goal. And that is what he means. It's a bad master. When it becomes a goal, then it becomes an idol that people worship. It's a bad master. It distracts us from what we're supposed to really be doing. It takes away our energy from where it should be spent. Imagine instead of buying all your favorite gadgets, you spend that money on a family vacation. How much healthier is that? How much more beneficial would that be? So much more is gained through a family vacation. Now, family vacation could become very expensive too, but the idea, at least, is a good idea. It's a healthy idea. This is not something I say. I mean, even professionals have said the same thing, that they have noticed that some families, of course, emphasize this. They never miss their annual vacation together as a family. And you could just imagine the results of something like that of the unity, the closeness between the brothers, the siblings, the parents and the kids. I mean, there's so much to gain from a family vacation. I just gave you one example where money can be spent in a, in a very beneficial way. So it's not just the money, it's how to spend the money, to be wise in spending the money properly. So if it's misused, if the money becomes a master, that that's all that matters to us. If that's all that the parents speak about at home, well, the children will, will follow that. It will matter to them too. That's all they will crave for. Right? You, you gotta have this, you gotta have this, you gotta have the latest car, you have to have two cars. Who said so? Now, part of the problem is the neighbor said so. There's this pressure. They have it. I must have it too. It's not just something that we crave as human beings. As you will soon see, part of the big problem is that it's society at large. It's the influence of others out there who are doing it, who want it. And we need to keep up with the Jones, I think they say, in this country. And that is, of course, part of the, the problem. So what are we going to do about this? I think the Rambam says it very, very succinctly. The Rambam was a great rabbi, Maimonides. He was a doctor, a philosopher, and he understood human nature very well. And he says in the same way that there are physical illnesses to the body, where we seek medical treatment, there's also mahalot nefesh. There are also illnesses that affect the spirit, our living spirit, the soul. And they are the midot, character, the characteristics, the traits. If those characteristics are poor, weak, they need to be dealt with. They need to be cured. Not everyone worries about them as much as you, they worry about their own physical body. The physical body, the pain that they feel, somehow they get themselves to go to the doctor and to take medication. But to treat a weakness in a characteristic flaw or some sort of uh, difficulty that people have, may have, we all have some imperfection, whether it's stubbornness, whether it's stinginess, whether it's anger, not everyone makes an effort to get help in these areas. 
in the same way we go for help to doctors for physical ailments, we should turn to the teachers, to the rabbis, to the professionals who can help us perhaps with these areas in our life, characteristics. Otherwise, for a person to be happily married will become much more difficult, much more of a struggle if he has certain characteristic flaws or if the two of them have. They may not be able to bond where the potential exists. They really are compatible. They really are for each other. They are soulmates. But there's something that is keeping them apart. And for the most part, it's usually those flaws in character that are left unattended. They can't be left unattended. They need to be dealt with and they need to be treated in the same way we would look after our physical bodies. Rabbeinu Yonah, great rabbi, lived many hundreds of years ago, says that the root or the cause of all the problems that people have stems from the tava, desire. Because the desire is something natural. It is natural for us to desire, we desire to eat, we desire to sleep. He says that it's the shoresh of kola perulot, it's the source or the root of all our actions, our movements, of everything we do. It just happens to be. That's okay. The problem is if it's not disciplined, if it's not restrained, if it's not directed properly. If, he says, if we are able to discipline them properly, then all of our limbs will follow our mind. What happens when this area is left untreated, the tava, the desire, is left to run wild, is that the sechel, the mind, follows the desire, follows the bodily needs. What Abenu Yunai is telling us, if we somehow are able to correct this, to discipline that tava, that natural force within us, that natural power that that is called desire. If we succeed to discipline it and to guide it properly, then the body, the limbs, will follow the seche, will follow the mind. Because we will have control. Instead of being subjugated or enslaved by our desires, we will be the master. We will be in charge. What have, we've seen so far is that the increase or the emphasis on materialism is indicative of a very weak spirituality in the individual. The two are not compatible. If one is very materialistic, it's indicative that his spirituality is either diminished, low, or missing altogether. Therefore, the immediate thing that one needs to be aware of, if he wishes to to do the right things in life is to increase his spirituality. We don't really have the time to go through all the possible uh, ideas that can help us gain greater control. There's quite a few ideas. I'm just going to share a few. But it has to begin with this, with the increase of spirituality in our life. Without that, it's a losing battle against the evil inclination, against the continuous battle that we have with ourselves, with this tava that Abenu Yonah says is the source of everything. It needs to be there. God implanted that in us. But it's up to us in our free will to manage it properly, to discipline it. Where do we start? By increasing spirituality in our life. Without that, it's a losing battle. How do we climb? How do we get to the peak of spirituality? How do we acquire it? The first step, I, I can say that it, perhaps it is the first step, but
but there are additional steps, is to recognize that this world is a temporary world. Our life is temporary. We're just passing through. As the rabbis tell us, this is a corridor. Our goal is to be in the world to come. Our goal is to be in the life of eternity. But in the meantime, we have to get through this life, through this mortal life, the physical life, where we are challenged, as the Kabbalah explains, this is what we need to do in order to acquire a certain amount of merits, in order for us to earn our share to the world to come, to the eternal world. If this world is just a temporary stay, a temporary visit of 70 years or so, then why overemphasize it? We're going to be leaving it behind anyway. Why accumulate all this wealth? What for? We don't take it with us. So this is a detail that most people forget about or they don't focus on. They think this is what this is it. We're here to stay. Build yourself a big castle with 12 bedrooms and 15 bathrooms. And I'm not just making up. I've seen homes like that. With a couple with not too many kids, with all the luxuries, swimming pool, tennis court, theater, bowling alley, everything that you can imagine in their own home. What's so sad about it is after they finished building it, the couple got divorced and they never ended up enjoying all that effort that went into design and planning and choosing the tile. And you can imagine what goes into a big home, all the decisions. And they ended up divorcing. And the home probably was sold. And probably the attorneys took all the money anyway. <laughs> That's what happens. And this does not just happen once in a while, it happens all the time. Recognizing that this is a temporary world that should not be overemphasized. This is not the Ikar, this is not what's the most important thing for us. This world. It's the world to come. But this is something that not everybody understands unless they've been exposed to this kind of information. There's a lot of atheists out there these days that don't believe there's anything else other than this physical world. They don't believe that there's a soul. So, what I'm saying right now may not convince them, this in itself. Oh, remember this is a temporary world. What do you mean temporary? That's the only world that they know of. So, these words perhaps will make some sense to those who already have some foundation that God created the world, that there's an afterlife. But even for those who don't yet understand this or don't know this, I think it's, a, it's, it's somewhere that one can begin. If he's sincere in search for the truth, can analyze what is going on with people's lives and come to similar conclusions. This can't be it. Man works himself up and by the time he's finally made it in life, financially, and he's ready to retire, he's taken away from this world? Why? Does this make sense to you? People don't think. That's where the problems begin, really. If people were to think a little bit more about what's the purpose of life, why am I here? It can't be to make money. It can't be. Because money has ruined people's life, if anything. It has not made them happier. And once they've made it, they finally have made it, they leave, either through a heart attack or whatever. They leave, everybody leaves at some point, some earlier, some later. This doesn't make sense. Why not stop to think about it? A lot of people who are non-believers have all sorts of arguments and they try to prove evolution, and they try to introduce all kinds of other explanations as to how man evolved. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why not start from scratch? What is life for? What is the purpose of all this? That's a better place to start. Start with meaning and purpose, and then work around it. People have many questions, many doubts. That's okay, but you gotta start somewhere. 
once we have a strong foundation that life is purposeful, then hopefully we will end up on the right track. We will hopefully figure many things on our own. That which we don't know, we may have to seek answers. But it's important to have a solid foundation on what is obvious. This life must be purposeful. There's so much design and so much beauty and harmony in creation. For it to just to have come about by accident doesn't make sense. The human intellect that can appreciate this and think about this is something so wonderful, something so special that people just overlook that fact. Where does this all come from? We know it comes from God, but that's not enough. What does God want of us? What are we here for? What does he want us to accomplish? These thoughts to ponder the, our mission in life, the purpose of everything, requires further study. It's good to think, but it's not enough to think. It's important to read, to study, as we call it in Judaism, Sifrei Musar, books on Jewish ethics and values. They will remind us they will remind us how terrible it is to envy, to covet, how unhealthy it is to, to be depressed about something that you shouldn't be depressed. All kinds of ailments that affect people today. If people do not learn, don't search for the, the, the wealth of information that is out there, they're going to be depriving themselves the most powerful medication for the soul, and that is the study of Torah, of the real values, what really matters in life. People don't stop to study. They want instant gratification. This generation much more so than in the past. I mean, secularism, materialism has always been around, but as I will explain soon, right before Mashiach comes, there will be a much greater emphasis for some reason than in the past. So getting back to what we were saying, it is important to increase the spirituality in our life and the way to go about it, the first step is to remember or to recall at all times that life here is temporary, transitory. Before you know it, it's over. One of my favorite stories that illustrates this point is with the Chafetz Chaim of blessed memory. This story must have happened about 80 years ago, perhaps. Actually, a little bit more, maybe 90, 500 years ago. An American tourist went to see the Chafetz Chaim. He came from America all the way to Radin, which is in white Russia. He wanted to see this great rabbi he heard so much about. So he was expecting to see a nice home, a regular home, normal furniture. He was in shock as soon as he entered. Barely any furniture. A couple of broken chairs, a small table. His first question to the rabbi was, Rabbi, where's all your furniture? So the rabbi turns to him and says, Sir, where's all your furniture? My furniture? I'm a tourist. I live in America. I don't bring along my furniture. The rabbi says, I'm a tourist too. I'm a tourist in this world. This is a temporary world. Why, why should I schlep, as they say in Yiddish, why should I drag along all my furniture? My real furniture is upstairs. I don't need it down here. Just the bare necessities. Beautiful idea here, beautiful point, expressed very, very nicely. Why overemphasize it here? we're not going to be staying around forever. Don't overdo it. It's not necessary. This is not where we're going to be staying forever. In order to understand this, in order to, to have this in our mind constantly, that everything is so temporary, we need to constantly study about this. We, we need to read the lives of, of the great people who lived before us and look at how they minimized 
all of these material comforts, physical comforts, how they didn't really care so much about it. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't have it at all. We're not necessarily uh, saying that one should completely, you know, eliminate this from his life and not uh, have anything to do with it. No, on the contrary. These things are important. If you are blessed with wealth and you are allowed to have some enjoyment of it, you're allowed to have a big home if you need it. But don't get lost in thinking that this is so important, that this is what matters. If you need something, if you truly need something, and you've come to that conclusion that it's not just motarot, excesses, but it's really something of a need, and you can afford it, go ahead. Buy it, enjoy it, use it properly. You have a big home, invite people over, share your wealth. As long as, as we said before, it's managed properly, it's fine. No one ever said, get rid of it. Nobody ever said, deprive yourself completely of it. We're against that. Get married, have children, have a beautiful relationship, eat normally, but be moderate about the physical needs that we all have. Moderation, discipline, that's what we're talking about, not to eliminate. Everyone according to his standard of living, there's some more, there's some less, as long as it's used properly, it's okay. But without studying, without receiving proper guidance, people can easily lose control. The reason why people lose control is what I said earlier. There's a lot of pressure from society. A lot of people out there who are doing something that is so different, so foreign to our values, and we live amongst them. And in the same way that one's accent is influenced by the place where he lives, his habits, his mentality will also be affected by the people around him. Not everybody is strong enough to resist the pressures of society. And when society is corrupt, Sometimes we're, the best thing to do is to just leave. As the Rambam said himself, just go somewhere else. If people are bad, you don't want to live amongst them. Leave. Go find yourself another place. But not everybody picks themselves up and just leaves. They don't realize how detrimental it is to themselves and to their kids if they stick around and adopt the habits of the society that they live in. One of the examples that I, I usually give in proving this point on how society influences and how the pressure can be so strong is with weddings. When people marry off their son, their daughter, it is a beautiful time. It is a very happy time in their life. Everyone looks forward to this day. But it does not come about so easily. It requires money. And this is where the problems begin. Well, I need to have 500 guests. Right? Everybody's expecting me to invite them. And we're talking about someone who's known in the community. I need to have a 10-piece band, orchestra, right? with a singer, and thousands of dollars on flowers. All of this adds up. But why do you have to spend all this money that you don't have? We're talking about somebody who does not have that money on four or five hours to feed all these people who will forget what they ate, who don't really care about necessarily making you happy. They're coming for the food and for the drink. Why go out of your way? No, they did so. I need to do so too. Everybody's doing it. How am I going to look? It's going to look bad. If I don't invite them all, they'll be so upset. They'll call me a cheapskate if I make it any less. People are not strong. They can't resist the pressure to do what they can afford. This is all you can afford. Who asks you to make it in a hotel if you can't afford it doing your own backyard? Isn't what's important 
how the couple are going to live as husband and wife much more than what you're going to serve at the wedding and which wines are going to be served. I mean, who cares about those things? About all the video and the pictures that they're barely going to look at maybe two, three times in their whole life? Ask people how many times they've seen their video of the wedding, if there was one. How many times have they looked at the pictures? We're talking about people who have been married for a long time already, 30, 40 years. How many times have they looked at all those pictures? I'm not saying you shouldn't have pictures. You could, you could have pictures, you could have a video, but don't overdo it. These things don't matter so much. They're not so meaningful. But there is that pressure. There is that pressure of taking the best photographer, the best musician. But what if you can't afford it? What's going to happen is these people who can't afford it, they're going to sink in debt to satisfy people who don't really care so much whether the couple will, will end up staying married or divorced. They didn't come to the wedding for that. Unfortunately, people are not necessarily going to be so overjoyed that the, the, the young couple is getting married. Instead, they look at it as an opportunity to feast. That's what it is. Of course, people are happy for you and they tell you Mazal Tov, but that's superficial. It's not real. It sounds very harsh what I'm saying, but that's the reality. People are not necessarily real. Many times they are fake. That's just a fact. They smile, but it's a fake smile. And you're putting yourself into debt to please them? For what? For a few hours? Especially if you don't have the money? Why? Why do so? It's, it's, it's not only a waste, I think it's, it's sinful. It's really sinful. You know how many people have heart attacks because of this? They can't cope with all the pressure that has built up. Why put yourself in this situation? There's a story in Israel about a father who uh, married off, I think it was his son. And in Israel, as you know, in the religious circles, all the yeshiva boys come to the wedding and they look at this as a great opportunity to have a good meal. Well, you know, in the yeshiva, it's not so, uh, uh, you know, you don't get to all the best foods that you would like to have. And in a wedding, you have the opportunity to enjoy a better meal. So the father, who was responsible for making this wedding, chose a good hall, invited, of course, all the boys' friends. I think he paid for the bus to bring them all. They served the first course, and immediately after the first course came dessert. That's it. One course and dessert. Nothing in between. Very, very simple. The groom came over to the father. What did you do to me? You embarrassed me. Such a skimpy meal. He says, wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow, the day after the wedding, he took his son and daughter-in-law to a big appliance store. He says, choose all the appliances you want. After this, we'll go to the furniture, and I'll let you choose any bedroom you want. Why should I give it to your friends when you need it yourself? All that money, I want to give you. I don't want to give it to your friends. Now, I'm not suggesting that one should not make a nice wedding. You know, if you can afford it, it's definitely a nice thing to do to be thankful, to be grateful to God that has enabled us to celebrate this day. And that is why we make a beautiful wedding, a nice wedding, as long as you can afford it, as long as it will not hurt you. That's fine. But be careful not to do it because others do so. That's something that people find very difficult. That is why you will find in the Torah the parashah of Nazir. A Nazir, a Nazarite, who abstains from wine. He has to be careful during the month or so that he's abstaining from wine, to abstain and to be careful with certain impurities. To abstain, to deprive yourself of wine, what's wrong with grape juice? It's kosher. 
you're taking upon yourself an additional prohibition. The Torah already has enough prohibitions. Stay away from this, stay away from that. Why do this? Why do extra? Why do more? Nezirut is actually a very powerful step, an additional step in being able to control oneself. The rabbis tell us on Kedoshim Tiyu, when the Torah tells us to be holy, sanctify yourself. What does it mean to sanctify yourself? It does not only mean to be careful with that which the Torah advises you to stay away from, but Kadeshet Atzmecha Be'mashem Mutar Lecha, true holiness comes from when you on your own sanctify yourself in those areas that are permissible for you. You limit yourself. Kedusha, holiness therefore involves making certain darim, certain fences for yourself. To limit yourself, not to deprive completely, but just to limit, to be more moderate. In that which is permissible, we're not even talking about that which is prohibited. We will stay away from that which is prohibited, but we will also try to limit ourselves in some areas where we can handle in what for, what, what, what is the need of this exercise? Because this is a gader, this is a siag, this is a fence that will help me, will give me the boost to elevate the ruhaniyut, to elevate the spirituality in my life, to be able to get closer to God through Kedusha. So this actually may be a good thing, what the Nazir is doing. And that is why it, the Torah says, Nezer elokav al rosho, he has the crown of God on his head. What does it mean, the crown of God on his head? You could either say the reason why he's doing this is because he recognizes the greatness of God, or the fact that he's doing it is indicative of how special this man is, how special this individual is. And that is why one of the commentaries says when the Torah describes his action of abstaining as kiyafli, that he commits himself, he makes a promise, a vow to abstain, why does it use the word kiyafli? Yafli, what kind of a word is that? The root of that word is amazement, pele, wonder. He's going against the trend. Ze pele, pele, what a great wonder. It's amazing that here, finally, we have one individual who is, I think they say in English, bucking the trend going against everybody, in other words, not paying attention, ignoring what everybody else is doing. I'm going to abstain. I'm going to limit myself because I know that this is what's going to help me to increase or to strengthen my spirituality, my connection with God. What is very painful to see when you go to weddings is that the Hatan and the Kalam what they were preoccupied with the most before their wedding is in choosing the band, in choosing the flowers perhaps, in figuring out how they're going to buy a house, what mortgage. This is what was preoccupying their mind more than anything else. Instead of what? Perhaps we should take courses so that we should succeed as husband and wife. People are so materialistic that abstaining is completely foreign to them. Why should I limit myself? I mean, I want to have this band, I want to have this. Well, wait a minute. Okay, you could have these things, but what about everything else that matters, that is even more important? Are you going to take classes on how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, how to be a good wife, how to get along? Are you going to also choose where to study, to succeed in those areas, at least be fair, be equal. You want to have that? Fine, but do so here too. You know what they're upset, they're upset upstairs at wealthy people? You bought yourself Italian furniture, expensive furniture, fine. 
You can afford it. You're entitled. But did you spend as much, at least as much money on charity? Were you fair? Or only did this matter to you? If one emphasizes spirituality and materialism alike, well, what could they say upstairs? He loves life. He enjoys it. He has the money for it. But he also does this. He doesn't minimize spirituality, his connection with God. He prays, he studies, he makes time to, uh, to take care of, of his family. He's a wonderful husband and father too. Okay, that's fine. The goal should be, however, to emphasize spirituality much more than anything else. But if one only emphasizes materialism and forgets about spirituality, it's noticeable. It's noticeable in, in the marriage. It's noticeable in many areas of life that they will not necessarily succeed. It's a shame. A young couple needs to learn how to get along with each other. You learn how to drive a car. A car is, the, is a dangerous uh, machine. You need to know how to handle this car. So you take courses. You get a license. People today are getting married without taking courses. And this is much more important than which band and which flowers they're going to have at their wedding. So the fact that people are not emphasizing what they should is indicative of how materialistic they have become. And this is not just on their own, of course, they are affected by their surroundings. Of all the physical attractions of all the influences out there, the most powerful one is money. Money is something that everybody wants to have. Everybody wants to make money. The next one is food. People enjoy eating, eating a good meal. These two, money and food, are normal. Normal, I mean, we handle them, we use them in our life. We purchase with money. We eat to survive. So these two, as powerful as they are, are necessary to some extent. Therefore, since there is some need for them, the author of the book, Misilat Yesharim, which in English is The Path of the Just, advises the following. The moment that we will recognize that the most important reason why man was created for is for a life of eternity, then all the bad qualities that he may have will decrease. In other words, if we want to be careful in how we use the money, in how we eat, these are necessities. If we want to make sure we have a good handle over them and control them, we have to remember, as we said earlier, that ikar briyata dama burchayonamaba. As long as we remember that ikar, that the most important reason why man was created was not for this world but as a way to get to Olam Abba, which is really the main destination, this thought, if you, we recall this thought at, at all times, will help us stay out of trouble. Therefore, what we see so far is that if one aspires at all times to be closer to God, to have a stronger relationship with Him, and strives much less to acquire all the material possessions in this world, it will be easier for him in many areas of life, in many of the struggles that we all have. There's a very interesting quote by the author of the book, Chovata Levavot, Duties of the Heart. And he says, I think this encapsulates pretty much everything that we've said before. The more one, I guess we can translate it, I don't want to say destroy the body, but 
the more one diminishes the strength of the physical body, this will enable him to build his sechel, his mind. The more one builds the body, or emphasizes it, fortifies it, this will bring about churban ha-sechel, the destruction or the weakening of the mind. If we want the sechel, the mind, to be the boss, to be in charge, to make the right decisions, we cannot let the physical body be in charge. In other words, if one has all this, these appetites and all these cravings, and he loves money, and he, that's all he cares about, I mean, he's, he's fortifying his physical body, his physical needs, this, in turn, will take away or diminish or weaken his mind. And the spirituality, of course. If we take control, as we said earlier, and discipline or diminish or limit the cravings of the physical body, we don't overemphasize it. We had one portion. We don't ask for doubles. By the way, this is one piece of advice given in various books. You want to control? You want to gain self-control? You have your favorite meal? Don't finish it. But you want to finish it. You want to lick up everything in the plate. It's your favorite dish. You want to teach yourself? Self-control, leave something behind. It's very difficult if this is your favorite dish. But this is what's necessary. If we want to gain self-control is to minimize or to diminish the emphasis on the physical body. In this way, we will be able to strengthen our mind. Another good positive consequence of diminishing the cravings of the physical body is that this is actually the step that's necessary to enable us to love God. The Torah says, Hashem you should love God. How could you love God? The rabbis tell us, the more one minimizes or diminishes his cravings, his love for, the physical, for this physical world, it will happen automatic. The soul is from God. The soul is divine. The soul wants to return to God. The soul does not want anything to do with this physical world. The soul is spiritual. But it's in the physical vessel that has all kinds of wants. Slow it down. Decrease the cravings. Take control. And you allow the soul to express itself. The soul will therefore want to attach itself to God. And that connection, of course, is it the love of God, the love of being close to Him. There's a beautiful mashal, a beautiful parable that explains how this works. There was once a farmer that came to town. He wanted to buy himself a suit. So the farmer, you know, in the farm they wear an over, overalls, I think it's called. So the, the tailor tells him, you're a size 44. With my eyes closed, I know this is your size. I don't have to measure. Here, try it on. So he tries it on. And the farmer is upset. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. Look how it doesn't fit me, how it's so tight. The tailor tells him, fool, take off your overalls first. And then put on the suit and you will see how it's a match. What do you expect? This will be on top of your overalls? I mean, this is a suit that you wear on your body, not on your overalls. Take off the overalls and you will see how it fits well. The overalls is an example of the material possessions of this world. If we're in love with material possessions and we wear it, it won't be possible to also wear or love that which is divine, that which is spiritual. If we remove the love and the connection, the strong connection to the physical possessions, then it will fit us perfectly. Will, this is what we will want. This is what we will aspire for. The reason why people don't have that aspiration, they don't think about it, they don't care about it, is because they're so attached to the physical world. It, of course, you can't tell them, love God, what God, what love. And it's no wonder why the love between husband and wife is also lacking. The love between people, to care about them as they did in the past, because people are selfish. They love themselves. There's no room for loving others if you love yourself. So this physicality or this materialism is really standing in the way of connecting 
with pe other people and, of course, connecting with God. What I want to do in the last few minutes is explain why now, why in the 20 and 21st century is this more of a problem than ever. There's an incredible, interesting midrash that very few people are aware of. There's a verse in the Torah, Vayishman Yeshurun Vayivat, that there will come a time when the Jewish nation will become fat, will become affluent, wealthy. Vayivat, and they will rebel. People who become wealthy, people who rise in life, they forget about their old friends, they forget about their old values perhaps. They become different kinds of people. That's what money does to people. And the Torah here describes something in the future, in the end of days. The Midrash goes on to say, this will take place three generations before Mashiach comes. A generation is about 25 years, say. I believe it happened after World War II. The standard of living has risen all over the world, but it, and especially in America. Much more than ever before. For the most part, people were poor in the past. The life that we have today is very, very different in many, many ways, but especially in the comfort level. People have become more affluent. There are people who are still struggling, but comparing them to what they had in the past, today people have a lot more. These are three generations before Mashiach comes. What this Midrash is telling us, or what the verse is telling us, is that this wealth, this sudden rise in the standard of living will not be so good. It will bring about a rebellion. It will bring about secularism. It will bring about a detachment from Judaism. They will become affluent. They will want to have a second home. They will have to have a, 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 a more comfortable lifestyle. Well, wait a minute. If all this wealth will be so not good for them that they will rebel, why give it to them? Why is God allowing the standard of living to rise? What good will come out of it? God is good, then there must be some good reason for it. The way I explain it is as follows. God knows what brought about the destruction of the second temple was baseless hatred, Sinatrinam. And baseless hatred is as a result of selfishness. Selfishness has been around for a long time. And it has caused many, many problems. It is destroying marriages, all because of selfishness. Selfishness means that people are self-centered, they care more about themselves, they want to be happy, they don't care about making others happy. They want to get their hands on anything they can to make themselves happy. And materialism, of course, contributes to that more than anything else, because materialism is an emphasis on oneself, on making oneself happy. And this all comes from the power of wanting to receive. God created the world where he wants humanity to give, not only to receive. We receive from God. Yes, because God gives. He gave us life. He gives us his blessing. He enables life. God is a giver, and he wants us to emulate his ways. I want you to be a giver too, not just a taker. A receiver. All the mitzvot in the Torah between man and, and his fellow friend is to enable that, to facilitate the sharing, the giving. If people would do so, there wouldn't be any war. There wouldn't be any lawsuits. Selfishness, that's causing all these problems, causing wars between nations too. And therefore God by raising the standard of living, says, I'm going to give you the ability, the means to be charitable and kind in a way that you've never could have done so before. You can have more money. You will be able to help people in ways you couldn't in the past. So this money has tremendous potential, this wealth. And many people out there are using their money in the right way, by sharing it with others, by helping those in need. How much money is being wasted by sending a capsule to land on an asteroid, if you know what I mean. I love science. I think a lot of things that are 
being done today are very important for science. But I think some of those projects are a total waste of money. Money that could be used in some other way to benefit mankind. But that's another topic. What is worthwhile and what is not is something that it requires a little bit more investigation. Sometimes scientists have pet projects. You know, people have hobbies, people have things that they like. But it all comes back, back to the same problem. If we don't focus on what's truly important in life, what God expects of us, what He wants of us, then we will be distracted and pursue all kinds of vanities. Secularism has become a problem. People have become more secular, less religious today because of materialism. And I think the best way to explain it is, what, is with what Solomon says in Mishlei, in Proverbs. One of the interpretations of the Pasuk, Yevakesh Nifrad, means that the reason why people want to be Nifrad Melokim, want to stay apart from God and not have God in their life, is because of the Tavot. They don't, they, they don't want to give up their desires. So they would prefer to believe in evolution that there is no God, God forbid. Oh, you come from a monkey anyway. Life has no meaning and purpose. Do as you wish. You know, everyone with his truth. Why? Why would somebody choose that over a meaningful life that God exists? Which is common sense, if you think about it. It's because of Tava. So Solomon reveals to us that the, the bottom line here is what's really pushing people to choose secularism over faith in God is Tavot. That's what's driving them. The Tavayevakesh Nifrad. That's the reason why people are Nifrad. People have become more Nifrad, more apart from God in this generation because of all the Tavot. They want to have Tavot. This is what their focus is in. Desires. But God says, I'm going to give you all this money, but I want you to do the right thing with it. I'm enabling you to repair the baseless hatred with baseless love. Baseless love, ahavat chinam is koach anetina. Learn to become a giver. Ultimately, people need to ask themselves from time to time, where am I holding? Am I more materialistic? Am I more spiritual? Am I a good person or not? Am I doing the right thing or not? There is a self-exam. You know, today people are talking about taking a selfie a self-photograph. There's a self-exam. You want to examine yourself where you are in all of this? It's very simple. Ask yourself one question. What is the most important thing to you in your life? What brings you satisfaction? What makes you happy? Is it the vanities of this world? Or is it being close to God and helping others? What is it? Think about what makes you happy. I assure you, Unfortunately, that many people will say, well, having a good car, having a comfortable home, vanities. I'm not, again, minimizing a good home. You may have it. Enjoy it if you can afford it. But this is not what we're here for. This is not what matters the most. A good marriage, a good relationship, helping the neighbor, helping those in need. Wouldn't it be nice if there were more Mother Teresas? people caring for others in, a, in a, such a selfless way. There are people in this world like her, but not enough. And that is why the world looks like the, the way it does. Very materialistic, very selfish. Everybody's into themselves much more in caring about the welfare of another human being. So ask yourself, what matters to you the most? And that is how one will be able to tell where he's holding. Last but not least, let us not forget what Solomon has told us in Ecclesiastes, in Kohelet. That the reason why people get confused and lose focus in life is not only because of what we said before, that they don't study and they don't stop to think. That too. But he summarizes it in one word. He says it's called kina, Envy. He says, envy? is what really messes everything up. 
We started off explaining how ta'ava, desire, is really the root of everything. Yeah, but ta'ava is a necessity, and we use it sometimes in the right way. We need to eat, we need to sleep. We have desires, as long as they're moderate, they're okay. What ruins it is called kina. What confuses people, what throws them off, is one characteristic called envy. As he says in Kohelet, ki akol kinat ish merehel. What drives people crazy, what drives them out of this world, as we started saying, and from the world to come. What gets them into trouble, ki akol kinat ish merehel. It's all because of envy. He has it, I have to have it too. I have a Rolex, but he has two, I have to have two. I don't have a Rolex, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The neighbor has it, I have to have it. Kina, it's all kina. That is why David Amelech says in Tehillim, Al tithar bemre'im, al tikane be'osei abla. I wrote it down here in English. Do not compete with evildoers, do not envy those who commit injustice. Be careful. Don't envy them, don't follow them, don't try to be like them. How many people got themselves into trouble because of that? Trying to outdo somebody else or trying to do what he's done. But he got away with it. So what? It's wrong. Envy that is driving them to the wrong things, to do the wrong things. Be careful with who you associate, who you befriend. There's a lot of people out there that don't have the right direction in life. And you're going to learn from them. Be careful. But because, unfortunately, there's so much confusion, and even if people have studied and they know these things and they agree with it, nonetheless, they will not be able to muster the strength. The Gaon of Vilna therefore advises as follows. If you can adapt two midot, if you can work on two characteristics, you will have the strength to do battle with all the ills of society. And those two characteristics are bitachon ve'istapkut, trust and reliance in God. If you trust and rely in God, then you will not be envious. That's what God wants me to have. He gives me what I need. Why should I want what the other one has? Bitachon b'ashem, people are so weak in this area. Trust in God. People who trust do not steal, do not covet. They trust. This is what God wants me to have. I trust in Him blindly. He cares about me. If he wanted me to have something, he would give it to me. If he didn't, then obviously he knows it's not good for me. I don't need it. It's all about trust in God. And the second characteristic is his tapkut, contentment. Be content. So what if you have a 2002 Toyota? It runs. It's in good condition. Why buy the latest car? Even a lease. Why go into debt? Why accumulate more expenses? Which will put more pressure on you and pressure on your marriage because of that. And the same applies to the women. The women sometimes put pressure on the man. Well, I must have this new dress. And I have to have this and I have to have that. And I need a new piece of jewelry. The women too need to be careful with not overdoing it. And many times, it's, it's, it's again, it's because of their friends or their relatives or both. You know, they just bought it, they just did this, you know. If one does not study Musar, as we said earlier, words of Musar, ethics, then it's very difficult to get lost and to be influenced by society. So this advice of the Gaon of Vila is very powerful, very good advice. Is concentrate on adapting the Midah of Bitachon, reliance and trust in God. And his tapkut and being content with a little bit that you have. Don't Aspire for more if you don't have it. Be content, be happy. If all you have for dinner is sardines and you don't have salmon, salmon steak, that's all. Yeah. Thank God we have what to eat. Sardines is good too. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. Thank God I have this. That's called istabkut. These, the Gaon of says, are klalim, are the rules of acquiring all the good midot, all the good characteristics. And I added, not only are they the rules of acquiring other good midot, they are the ones that will give us the strength to be able to contend with all this pressure in society. As opposed to those who desire and covet 
right? they will have trouble. They will want more and more, and they will never be happy. Just to finish up, many of you are familiar with the temple, the holy temple that the Jewish people had. A temple is a beautiful structure. It is something that we're all awaiting for the third one to be rebuilt soon. But let's not forget that one can build a sanctuary, a temple for God in his own heart. Vasuli Mikdash, God says, make for me a tabernacle. Why? What's the purpose of the tabernacle? Because I want to reside in the heart of every you, one of you. How is that going to happen? The Rabbi of Bells once asked all of his disciples, where is God? And they said, what do you mean, where is God? God is everywhere. He says, no, no, no. God is only there where you let him in. See the difference? Of course God is everywhere, but unfortunately, not everybody lets him in. So that, that is really the mission, or should be the mission of every one of us, is to build a sanctuary for God in our heart, in our home, to let him in. And for that, of course, we have to aspire, we have to want it. But if we want it very, very much, God willing, it will happen, and we will have the merit of God residing in our heart. Amen.